You're listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled, When Will Digital Transportation Impact Oil Markets? When exactly will oil markets feel the pressure from Tesla? Not anytime soon, but Tesla is just a distraction from the main show. I attended yet another meeting in Calgary recently with an oil company, where the attendees dismissed the impending threat to oil demand from encroaching transportation change. I get that. Oil companies are vested in the status quo. But the signposts of change are now popping up everywhere. France, the UK, Norway, India, and China all have plans to phase out fossil fuel cars. Tesla is hammering the competition in the stock markets, and it's even hurting car companies. Even big oil execs know the change is approaching. But at what point would there be enough demand destruction in transportation fuels that the demand shortfall would impact the price of crude oil? This is a twisty problem if your goal is precision, but a blunt way would be to figure out how much gasoline a typical car uses each year, estimate how quickly cars can adopt digital and electric features, and identify the point where digitally destroyed demand triggers a price move. I start with how many cars are out there. Well, in fact, there are about a billion cars in the world, give or take according to a Paris-based organization that tracks these sorts of things. They also estimate that the global car manufacturing capability is about 72 million units per year. As for demand, about 40 million cars are for brand new drivers, i.e. growth and demand, and the balance, 30, are replacements as old clunkers are junked. That gives us a rough estimate of the number of gasoline engines out there and the growth rate in the market, say 5% per year or so. For convenience, let's just ignore lawnmowers, jet skis, motorboats, and other gasoline internal combustion engines or ICE. I'm sure they matter, but my intuition suggests they're not the majority of consumption. The top six major car companies account for over 50% of vehicle production, and all claim to be developing new drivetrains that rely on electric power partially, that is the hybrids, or fully, the all-electrics. Ford, for example, clearly states that all-electric is the way to go to achieve a zero emission future. Hybrids may be just a stepping stone. If you want to check out the top six um, producers, they are Toyota, Volkswagen, Hyundai, GM, Ford, and Nissan. There are other transportation technologies at play though. What we don't hear as much about, but will have just as big if not bigger impact, is all the other technologies that are getting stuffed into the car. Three key advances are moving along at very high pace and much faster than designing and building new electric drivetrains. First are the connected cars. Once vehicles get on the grid, they can talk to one another. Once that happens, cars can drive much closer together because the computers can take over the brakes. A computer's reaction time is so much better than human. By driving closer together, cars can draft, just like bikes in the Peloton, the Tour de France. Drafting is extraordinarily efficient. Cyclists gain a 40% productivity improvement when they cycle in formation. Ducks get the same benefit flying south, and so will vehicles on the highway. And cars don't need to be electric to be connected. Next are autonomous cars. Once vehicles become autonomous, and they don't need to be fully electric to be more robotic, cruise control is a robot, they can take over more of the driving. No more jackrabbit starts, hard braking, idling while waiting, and inefficient gearing on hills. This equates to fuel efficiency and therefore less fuel demand. By how much is uncertain, but a recent case study by some Tesla drivers showed that a Model S, normally delivering about 250 to 300 kilometers on a single charge, could get up to 1,000 kilometers on a single charge. Next is shared cars. Services like Car2Go, Uber, Wim, and Lyft eliminate the need to even own a vehicle at all. They reduce the demand for new and replacement vehicles. Most personal vehicles are used just a fraction of their available capacity. Most of the time, they sit idle in garages and parking lots. Assume a standard commuter personal car drives 25,000 kilometers per year at an average speed of 60 kilometers per hour. That's a utilization rate of 4.7%. To many millennials, it simply doesn't make sense to own something that expensive that gets so little use when a shared vehicle is just around the corner. As the shared car fleet grows, Will they acquire dumber, old gasoline models or newer, smart models that incorporate autonomous, connected, hybrid, and electric features? I'm betting on smarter cars. Next is digital trucks. 
The same technologies that also also apply to the trucking industry, which are even more susceptible to these technology developments, except perhaps the sharing phenomenon. Truck operators aim for high utilization already, and so their biggest lever to improved economics is to reduce fuel consumption, i.e. connected and automated. The truck fleet turns over much faster, and there's only 330 million trucks worldwide, compared to 1 billion cars. The combined impact of these three digital advances suggests that as much as a 40% fuel reduction for long-distance driving, a halving of the number of vehicles to raise their utilization rates, and a fuel efficiency gain of 25% from the robotic management of the vehicle. I'm precisely wrong in all of these estimates, but they are directionally correct. So where's the tipping point? Well, here's a way to think about it. Oil markets tipped into oversupply in June of 2014 by a piddling amount. OPEC estimated anywhere between just 1 and 2 million barrels of oil, uh, daily per oil production. So, oil markets are finely balanced, as 1 to 2 million barrels per day was about 1 to 2% of daily production. Back then, somewhere around 95 million barrels a day. In other words, not a lot. So the question is, how many of these newfangled digital cars does it take to displace 1 million barrels of crude oil per day? Let's call this the demand destruction tipping point. The world consumes about 100 million barrels of oil per day, or about 36.5 billion barrels per year. About 20% of that crude oil, more or less, is converted to gasoline for gasoline cars, or about 7.65 billion barrels of gasoline per year. Therefore, the billion cars out there consume about 7.65 billion barrels of gasoline, which is about 7.6 barrels of gasoline per car per year. Now that's a really blunt instrument approach to the numbers, but it does give us an idea of the demand per car. A million barrels of crude oil, or about 200,000 barrels of gasoline per day, or 73 million barrels of gasoline per year, supplies 9.5 million cars per year at the rate of 7.65 barrels per car. Therefore, just 10 million all-electric cars on the road, or 20 million highly digital cars, will permanently destroy demand for 1 million barrels of crude oil. The first million all-electric are on the road now, but the shared car fleets are growing very rapidly. Autonomous vehicles are coming fast, and the automakers have started the conversion. It won't take 10 years to get to 10 million because of the cumulative effect of adding digital cars every year. And once we reach the tipping point, demand destruction will accelerate. Diesel demand destruction won't be far behind. What's happening with oil supply? Well, OPEC's attempts to manage oil production in the past for the past several months has not worked out. Prices are still stubbornly low, stuck in the 50s. Supply management isn't going to work out because many oil producing nations, all of OPEC, Norway, and Russia, realize that their only play now is to produce their oil as fast as possible before the tipping point arrives, prices fall again, and their reserves are stranded. Furthermore, shale will just get more productive over time increasing supply. Recovery rates for shale to oil deposits are much lower than for conventional oil deposits, but by applying digital to the problem of improving recovery rates in shale, the industry will unlock a lot more reserves. Today, shale recoveries for gas are 15% compared to over 90% for conventional. Quadrupling recovery rates for shale is a digital problem, solved by studying flow rates, pressures, and propent behavior in the shales. More supply will create yet more pricing pressure. So what are the implications for the oil industry? Well, it may very well be too late for Canada to worry about pipelines to supply global markets. The markets we want to supply, Asia and Europe, are intent on eliminating oil from the transport sector. It will likely be more economic for Europeans to satisfy their dwindling demand from existing suppliers, suppliers in the Middle East, Russia, and the North Sea. The threat to high-cost oil producers, though, is existential. If costs and productivity are not reset to world-beating levels, those reserves are valueless. $50 is not the floor, it's the ceiling. Companies in the industry or serving the industry need to start thinking about diversification. Once the tipping point is reached, balance sheets are going to come under severe pressure as investors reprice the value of reserves, service companies, and related businesses. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.